Got it? Thumbs up, thumbs sideways. All right. <laughs> so this is just one half of my doodle chart. This is just the specific liens. And they are all these that we have talked about are only attached to your real property because that's what specific means. Now, what effect do these liens have on your property? Once again, chapter two, I told you guys, we're gonna spend the rest of our book taking away those rights. What effect does this lien have on your property? It reduces your right of disability, uh, not disability, it reduces your right to get rid of your property. Remember I told you, you could give it away? Well, if you've got an equitable, voluntary, specific lien, i.e. a mortgage, it's going to be hard for you to give that property away because you owe fifth third $100,000. If you owe your HOA, it's going to be hard for you to give it away. If you owe your back real estate taxes, it's going to be hard to give it away. So a lien does reduce your right of disposition. And we showed that several chapters ago. Remember, if you owe $160,000 and it's only worth one hundred and fifty, dollars how do you sell the property? You literally would have to come to the table with 10 grand. Well, I don't have 10 grand. Then you can't sell the house. So these liens that pile up, you got your first lien, you got a second lien, and then you've got a vendor's lien, and you haven't paid your HOA, and there's real estate taxes. In essence, they reduce your right of disposition. And I'm pretty sure that we went through this concept, but let me show about it. Remember, you got that $150,000 house, you got a $100,000 first lien, you can sell that property pretty easy. You just sell it for 150, pay the $100,000 off, walk away with 50 grand. Well, now you decide you're gonna go out and get a $50,000 second lien. Little more difficult because now you have to sell it for at least 150 so you can pay off the first lien and the second lien. But now let's say you forgot and didn't pay your HVAC person, now you can see the problem you're in. You owe 160 in liens against your property. It's only worth 150 in essence, unless you have the ability to bring $10,000 to closing. In essence, your right of disposition is now completely gone. You can't sell it or you can't give it away because of the liens that are currently on it. So as the liens increase, your right of disposition or your ability of disposition goes down. Unless you're Elon Musk and worth billions of dollars, that's a whole separate story, okay? We talked about the subordination agreement previously. A subordination agreement, remember, allows two adjacent liens to switch places. It allows two adjacent liens to switch places. So let's go back over here for a second. You could refinance your first, which in essence is a sale with a repurchase. It would move down here because it comes in. Number one slides, the number two slides to number one now, it would come in second. But if you had a subordination agreement, 
it would allow these two to flip flop. So this 100,000 goes back to a first position again, and the 50,000 goes back to a second position again. That is called a subordination. It is where two adjacent liens switch places. They have to be adjacent. It does not allow for, you know, if first lien, second lien, if the first lien comes out, second lien goes to first, third lien goes to second, the new one comes in at third, subordination does not allow that. They have to only switch adjacent. Third would technically have to go to second and then go to first. All right. So, in a subordination agreement, allows for two adjacent liens to switch places. This happens very frequently on a first and second loan and the first refinances, and then they flop back again. All right. Yes? All right. If there is a misunderstanding, please feel free to ask a question. I see thumbs up a lot, but then I see the test scores. So there is also, just so you know, maybe we haven't talked about it, in your upper back corner, there's a chat function. If you guys want to ask a question, but really don't want to go on camera, you can chat a question to me as well. I want to make sure that's available because as we're doing the class here, I see a lot of, so, if it gets confusing, please let me know. I will try a different method of explaining it. With that being said, we all thumbs up? All right. <clears throat> so let's talk about your real estate taxes. Let's talk about your real estate taxes. There are two kinds of real estate taxes that we will discuss. And this one, I have a hard time. I think that's spelled correctly. It's called an ad valerum tax. Ad valerum, meaning at value. Our real estate taxes are an ad valerum tax. Your $100,000 house has a tax based upon the $100,000, where a million-dollar house has a taxes based upon the value of a million dollars. They are called an ad valerum, meaning it's at the value of the taxes. Now, how, tax, how this ad valerum is calculated, it is calculated on an annual basis and it's a very simple math calculation, very hard to get to. Now, the first thing I wanna talk about, it's based upon this thing called an assessed value. All right, very important you understand the fact that this value is a new value it's one we haven't talked about to date. We've talked about the appraisal value. We talked about the loan value. Now we are going to talk about what the government says your house is worth called the assessed value. It is a new value that you will use. In this course, there are probably five different values that you need to keep straight as to far as which one we're doing. 
if we're talking about capital gains, it's the sales of price, that's a value. If we're talking about getting a loan, that is the appraised value. If we're talking about paying, paying our real estate taxes, it's the assessed value of the property. It is what the state of Indiana thinks your house is worth. Not what you think it's worth, not what you paid for it, not what Santa Claus says it's worth, it's what the state of Indiana says it's worth. If you pull your tax record, it will tell you the assessed value, all right? Now, here's the cool thing. On the exams, it will give you the assessed value. You cannot calculate it yet. You do not have the ability or the experience to calculate this. So on the exam, they will tell you using an assessed value of, so they will give it to you. Warning, everybody listen. They will also give you a bunch of confusion factor. They will say something like, you bought a house for 100,000 that was appraised at 95, but the assessed value is 108. What are the taxes? You have to understand taxes only deal with the assessed value. Those other two numbers I just told you are there just to confuse you. All right. Yes, sir. Repeat that one more time. Yeah. The test will try and confuse you by giving you three or four different values. You have to understand if you're calculating real estate taxes, you only need the assessed value. So the test question is going to say something like, you paid 100 for it, it appraised for 90, but the state says it's worth 110. That's the 110 assessed value is the only number you need in that calculation. That appraised value and the purchase price mean nothing when dealing with real estate taxes. They are there just to confuse you, all right? Same thing if you wanna get tricky and flip it. If we said you bought it for 100, you appraised for 110 and assessed at 120, what's the loan value? Now you're only going to use that sales price. You wouldn't use the assessed value because there are four or five different values that we deal with and you have to understand taxes deal with the assessed value. Capital gains deal with the sales price. Loans deal with an appraised value. So don't let them trick you because, because the math is so simple, I feel that the only way they can really mess with you is to try and trick you like this. So let's continue. The assessed value times this thing called an equalization factor. What the heck is going on? That's supposed to say equalization factor. An equalization factor, once again, is a number you cannot calculate. You cannot do it it will be given to you on the exam. Let me explain a little bit and see if you can get it. So when the state determines assessed value, they will go into a neighborhood and do this thing called a bulk appraisal. The state cannot look at all of our houses individually and give a value to it. So what they would do 
is they would look at all of our houses and go, oh, the majority is a three bedroom, two bath house. So we will assess that value at $100,000. But wait, Gunjan's house is actually a four bedroom house. Hers is slightly different. So we have to adjust her value to meet ours. So we would bring her value down because hers is four. We would give her an equalization factor of 0.8. Okay. Now here's a math concept I need to make sure you understand. When you multiply a number by another number that's less than one, what happens to that, that number? It goes down, right? 10 times 0.8 is only eight. So to bring your value down, we would multiply by a number less than one, 0.99, 0.2, 0.1, 0 0.45, okay? So we would give her an equalization factor of 0.8 to bring the value down. And Shauna's house is a two bedroom. So we would give her an equalization factor of a number greater than one to bring the value up. Like 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3. The good thing is that number just will be given to you on the exam. It'll say using an equalization factor of 0 0.6. All right. Another test hint. If they don't tell you an equalization factor, what is your assumption about that house? It is equal, which is an equalization factor of what? One. And anytime you multiply a number by one, you get that number. So if they don't give you an equalization factor, don't call me and go, well, I can't do the problem because they didn't tell me. Well, if they didn't tell you, the assumption is that it's a one and they you don't really, doesn't affect the math. 